Father, we thank you for the great truths that are expressed in that anthem. That the death of Jesus on the cross has great power. And the resurrection proves it. I pray that you will prove that in us today. And that we will embrace that truth. That your power might be employed in our life. I pray that for every one of us in this room today, that the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection will be realized and that not one drop of Jesus' blood will be wasted on us. Amen. You know, I enjoy watching cooking shows on television. You know, the shows where these chefs, they whip this stuff up. And I tell you what, I've never seen one where it looked bad. I, even if it was food I didn't like, it looked good when they did it. And it, it's just kind of a vicarious experience. You know, you watch them whip this stuff up and you think, man, that, that looks good. I bet that would taste good. And uh, I can't cook. I'm not, a, I'm not a good cook at all. But, uh, but I can sure consume and, uh, and I enjoy watching those cooking shows and seeing how those that really know how to do it, do it, and do it well. Because they do it well, people are interested. I mean, they tune in and watch the show like me. People like to watch it. And then usually when you're exposed to a really good cook, one of the typical things that happens is a question comes after the meal, can I have that recipe? I want that recipe. And on those shows, they, they give you a recipe or they tell you where to find it so that you can do it too. Because see, people that are good at something and other people who want in on that try to emulate them and learn from them so they can have a part of that as well. So they can enjoy that experience. Well, you know, the Bible says about us the Bible says, is it appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Now, fill your name in the blank there where it says man. We're all under a death sentence. Everybody here is someday going to go. This life, as we now know it, is not forever. And the reality is that none of us can guarantee tomorrow. We talked earlier about how we're all stewards and managers of God's property. And what really proves that is just die and find out how much you're going to take with you. The same amount you brought with you. Zero. Having said that, since, that tr since that's true... And since what happens when we die is permanent, whatever happens after we die is permanent, why would anything else matter? What, what runs a close second to addressing that issue for anybody? Yet so many people live either in denial or in ignorance. And don't ever give that a thought. I submit to you that that should be the most important driving force for decisions made on a daily basis is this could be my last one. Because it very well could. Jesus died. Unlike us, He didn't have to. He had no sin. He wasn't under a death sentence. Jesus died... And he died not for himself, but for us. Amazingly, God allowed Jesus' death to satisfy his wrath and his judgment for your sin and mine. And to prove that, Jesus rose on the third day after he died on a cross outside Jerusalem. He rose from the dead. A grave couldn't hold him because he didn't deserve to be there to begin with. But it proved he didn't die for himself. He died for us when he came from the grave. I am always think of that great line. Some of you have heard me share before. Susan Perlman of Jews for Jesus was once addressing the fact that 
Um, Jewish people have always been very sensitive to the fact that they've been blamed. In fact, I have Jewish, a, a Jewish friend who is a, a strong believer in Jesus. Some of you have heard his testimony, who as a teenager talked about the fact that growing up in Philadelphia that he had Gentile friends who called him a Christ killer. Well, I, I don't know any Jews that were alive 2,000 years ago that are alive today other than Jesus. Uh, so I don't know how that could be possible. At the same time, that's a bad rap. If Jesus died for everybody, then uh, everybody's equally responsible for Jesus' death. But in addressing that sensitive issue, Susan Perlman had a great line. She said, I cannot see how anybody could be held responsible for anyone's death who was still alive. Don't you love that? Jesus is alive. How can anybody be blamed for killing him? <laughs> He's not dead. He's alive. He beat it. He died and lived to tell about it. And as we rely on him as our substitute and our sin bearer, we receive the benefit of his death and a forever life beginning right now. Jesus said, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. You see, Jesus isn't bragging. He's just stating facts. He died, lived to tell about it. He knows what it's like to die. And he knows what it's like to live again because he did it. I would submit to you that Jesus is the resonant expert on dying and living. And Jesus has the only recipe for dying and living to tell about it. And this is his cookbook right here. And the recipe for life is in this book. It's Jesus' recipe. And I would submit that we need to look at this recipe. Why? Because Jesus made another promise in connection with this issue. He said, as he stood by the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And listen to this. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's what Jesus said. Now, that's an audacious promise. But he proved that it wasn't just hot air or braggadocia because he not only called Lazarus back from the dead, but he called himself back from the dead when he died. He has the power to deliver. And notice he says that not only does he have the power to rise again, he is willing to share that ability with us. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die because eternal life will start right now. I want that. How about you? I want that. How can we receive the victory that Jesus wants to give us, the victory over the sin and the judgment that we're under and the death that's the result? Well, I think we can answer that question of how to receive that victory by looking this morning at how Jesus lived, and we can see most poignantly how he lived by watching how he died. And in that, we can discover who he is and what he's like and what we can rely on as we seek him to share in his victory over death. Now, nowhere do we see this reality more powerfully demonstrated than in Jesus' death on the cross. I'd like for you to stand with me, if you would, and let's read responsively from Luke 23, 32 to 46. Luke 23, 32 to 46. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, 
This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Amen. You may be seated. Luke records three statements of Jesus from the cross. Three statements that Jesus made while being crucified in Luke. The first is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The second is, assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And the third is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, I looked at one particular English Bible translation so it would be consistent. And I went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I looked at the crucifixion of Jesus, the count of the crucifixion. And I counted each word spoken by Jesus. And I totaled those words, and then I looked at the characteristic of each of the statements of Jesus, and I discovered if my math is right, that 60% of the words spoken by Jesus from the cross were addressed to God the Father in prayer. 60% of Jesus' words from the cross were words of prayer spoken to God the Father. You see, that shouldn't be surprising because Jesus was more than anything a man of prayer And so even as he died, he was a man of prayer more than anything. In fact, a good number of those prayers were not, quote, original in the sense that he just thought of them. A good number of them were actually quotes of prayers found in the book of Psalms that Jesus was just re-praying back to the Father as he comforted himself. I want to tell you something. You want to learn a great truth as to how to enjoy the peace of God and the power and the presence of God? You want to how to know the comfort of God? You take the Word of God back to God in praise to prayer before Him, and particularly the Psalms. The Psalms are the key, the best medicine I know to avoid discouragement and depression. You pray the Psalms out loud to yourself. It's important for your own soul to hear you talking and speaking the Word of God to yourself. Pray them out loud. Jesus did that from the cross in His hour of greatest trial. What does that teach us about the importance of that discipline, of praying the Psalms? So what we see is that 60% of His words were prayer. However, if we look at Luke, 100% of His words were either prayer or an answer to prayer. So everything Jesus said from the cross recorded by Luke was something to do with prayer. With prayer. Because prayer permeated Jesus' life. What I'd like to say is let's examine His prayers from the cross and see how He lived and how He died, discover who He is, and as a result, what He's willing to do for you. What He's willing to do for you in sharing His gift of victory over death. You see, I believe that the content of our prayers reveal more about us spiritually than anything else in our life. What you pray about says more about who you are in your relationship with God than anything. And I believe that's true for Jesus as we examine His prayers from the cross. Let's look at the first one. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, this is an amazing statement because nobody asks for forgiveness. I would submit that this is a unilateral, unconditional extension of forgiveness 
based on the ignorance of the sinner. Now, that's a fancy, long-winded way of saying that Jesus initiated and there weren't any conditions. There wasn't an if you do this then. Jesus just extends the forgiveness based upon the ignorance of the sinners. Now, you see, what we see here is, I believe, that he was no doubt referring here to the Roman soldiers. There's no way to prove that. That's gospel according to Brad, second opinion, chapter 3. It's my, but it's not a blind idea. Why? Because I believe what we see here in operation is what is, in my opinion, uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, missing truth in the American church. And that is the principle that Jesus uh, articulated in Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. To whom much is given, much is required. And if you read that statement in context, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And we in the American church have been more blessed than any group of people in history. And yet, the increase of wickedness and the toleration of sin in Christians' lives, in their individual lives, but more importantly, just spiritual apathy is on the rise and snowballing dramatically. Church attendance is easily below 10%. Easily. And I'll, I'll give you a scientific formula for that right here in Volusia County. Look at how many cars were on the road this morning. Anybody getting a traffic jam trying to get here? Anybody have to have police directing traffic to get you through because there were so many cars? No. And if you want to know what a traffic jam looks like when almost, still not everybody, but almost everybody's on the road, hurricane evacuation. My prayer is that Sunday morning will look like hurricane evacuation in Volusia County because everybody's fighting to get to church. And we take for granted and we act as if we're doing God a favor by coming to church or doing something that's related to being a Christian. Listen, there's a fine line. Everybody needs to be appreciated, but I've been convicted a number of times, and it's to my chagrin that too many times I have acted like that someone is helping somebody out or doing somebody a favor by coming to church. Let me tell you something. It's a privilege to be here this morning in this room. This, this opportunity was purchased by Jesus Christ at the cost of His own blood. And what we have done, we have accommodated a consumer mentality too long in the American church. And, and I, you know, one of my, I, I've got, you see, we don't process things theologically. One, one of the things that I struggle with, I, one of the things I'd love to do someday, and we, there's logistical issues, and I'm almost afraid to go here because I don't want you to hear what you think I'm saying. But... But I'd, I'd love to do like a midweek service for people who have to work on the weekends. There's a lot of people who have legitimate weekend conflict because of work, and they can't. I'd love to do that. But my struggle is I don't want to do that to accommodate somebody's recreational plan. Why? Because there's a reason we meet on Sunday. When the early Christians for 300 years met to worship, Sunday was not a holiday. It was a regular work day, and they had to accommodate around their work schedule and other obligations to worship on Sunday. They intentionally gathered on Sunday. Why? Because it was the day Jesus rose from the dead. And as a result, because of the power of their witness and the power of God in their life, in a little over 300 years, Sunday became a holiday because of the influence of believers on the culture. What's happening today is that Sunday is becoming something other than a holiday because of the lack of influence of believers on the culture. And to whom much is given, much is required. We're saturated with the Bible, with the freedom to worship. Did you see this week? I, I, I've got to move, because, but my goodness, um, I didn't get up to preach till late. Uh, so, uh, but... Um, but did you see on the week the church in Syria, if you're watching the news, there are many Christians in Syria. 
The Syrian Orthodox is the largest group. But you know who the largest evangelical group is in the country of Syria where they're having a civil war right now? It's the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Brothers and sisters in Christ that are worshiping there. And they interviewed one of the pastors, not from the Alliance, but from the Syrian church on the national news this week. And the rebel group there is starting to massacre and wipe out Christians. Why? Because they want no Christians because they have been captured by a radical Islamist uh, mentality and they're wanting to wipe the Christians out of the country. That's what's going on in other parts of the world as those Christians try to gather on Easter for worship. So what is God's perspective on us as He considers them? Why isn't that us? Why don't God has blessed us and to whom much is given, much is required. People who don't trust Christ, sadly, according to Jesus, are going to hell. That's the reason we need to spread the good news. But you listen to this. Hell will not be the same temperature for everybody. Because to whom much is given, much is required. And Jesus demonstrates this principle from the cross because He said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Their sin was one of ignorance. Ignorance. And if you look back in the Old Testament, you find in Leviticus and in Numbers, in the sacrificial system of the Hebrews, where the tabernacle, the temple, where they slaughtered the animals, there was no sacrifice for willful sin, except thievery, in which a 20% restitution for thievery was in included. Now, if someone sinned willfully... That means premeditated. In our language today, they were executed. So God treated sins of ignorance differently than sins of knowledge. And our degree of culpability is directly proportional to what we know. Moses murdered somebody and didn't get any repercussions except run out of Egypt. But after he had a face-to-face -face meeting with God, he got mad and hit a rock with a stick, and God said, you can't go into promised land. Why? Because he knew more. He should have known better. And we in this culture know more. We should do better. And the sad thing is our culture is eroding for biblical values. The Supreme Court just this week is considering before the highest judicial authority in our culture whether or not marriage should be something other than a man and a woman. Absolute dissolution of the culture is before us. And the church is asleep in the light. It's not because of what we do here on Sunday. It's because of what we do Monday through Saturday that needs to make the difference. Forgive me for preaching. You see, Jesus offered a prayer for His murderers, for their forgiveness. And in mercy, even in their ignorance, He sought it for them. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means whatever He is, whatever He was, He still is. And Jesus' prayer proves that He wants to forgive you and He wants to give you a new start in life. Jesus initiated that. I don't care where you've been. You understand the Lord Jesus Christ right now wants to forgive you and give you a new start in life. And He proves that by His prayer from the cross. And then we see the second answer to prayer when He says to the repentant thief, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Not only does Jesus proves that He wants to forgive you and give you a new start in life, He also says to the thief, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Notice the context. The thief confessed and was truly repentant. He truly was disgusted with his sin and he was honest with himself and with Jesus and with the other thief about who he was. And notice how Jesus responded to that. How did Jesus respond to that? Jesus responded by offering forgiveness. You see, one of the huge blunders that we make is we confuse true repentance and confession with a sense of entitlement that leads to presumption. God is not obligated to forgive anybody. God is not obligated to forgive anybody. It is a gift offered by His grace. 
But yet so many times we miss on that because we don't imitate the thief. The thief was basically saying, Lord, I recognize I deserve to go to hell. Confession means to agree with. The Greek word behind the English word confess is homo legeo. Homo meaning one or same. Lego means to speak. Put them together to speak the same thing, to agree with. We agree with God. I heard some people say tragically, well, if I sin, I know God will forgive me. So I'll just go ahead, you know, I know this is sin. But listen, that person's not repenting. Don't presume upon that. Don't be presumptuous about that. Faith and presumption are not the same thing. Just recently, knew of some college students who go to a Christian college and there were some kids kicked out for drug use and immoral behavior. And some of the classmates were heard saying, well, I thought this was a Christian college. Don't they forgive? There was no repentance. There was only arrogance about the sin. The thief on the cross was humble. He was repentant and acknowledged Jesus. And Jesus didn't just answer. Don't you? His question was, remember when you come into your kingdom? Jesus said, today. <laughs> That, you see, when we come to the Lord on His terms with a humble heart, we get more than we ask for. Better. Better. He would have settled for the kingdom, but Jesus had something better for him today. God will do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within you. That's who God is. The Bible says, therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, he's doing the same thing today he was doing on the cross. He's waiting for you to turn to him and say, Lord, remember me. I don't deserve you, but you deserve me. And you hear him say the same. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today, you're going to receive eternal life through me. You see, when we come to Jesus in true humility, regretfully acknowledging the truth about ourselves and gratefully acknowledging the truth about Him, listen to this, He loves to forgive our sins. He loves to give us eternal life. That's who Jesus is. He proves it from the cross. Jesus' prayer proves that He took time, and His answer to prayer proves that He took time while being murdered to answer the repentant sinner's prayer. He was in the process of being murdered. Listen, that's happening to me. I'm saying to the guy, don't bother me. I'm busy. I'm real busy. Jesus took time while being murdered to forgive that repentant man's sin. You think he's got time for you today, sitting at the right hand of the Father in glory? I think he does. I think he's waiting for you to turn to him. Well, the third thing Jesus says is his last prayer. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is not one of those that isn't original. This is a quote from Psalm 31, verse 5. Write that down, Psalm 31. I want you this afternoon to go home and read that whole psalm. The whole psalm is a prayer. In Hebrew, part represents the whole. In the Hebrew mind, Jesus was thinking of this whole prayer on the cross. This was his prayer. You read that and see how amazing that prayer is in the context of Jesus being crucified. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathes his last. Now, there's a fascinating insight from John 10, 17 and 18. Let's read that together out loud. John 10, 17 and 18. Therefore, my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Now, having said that, having said that, understand that Jesus here is saying that he has a control over when he dies. But notice where he got that control. He laid aside his divine privileges. He got it because he submitted to the will of the Father in faith. That's where he got it. You see, that's exactly where you and I get our ability to enjoy the life of God as we submit to His will in faith. You see, He says, this command I've received from my Father. Jesus had control over when He died, but even that was only available through obedient faith in God the Father. You see, Jesus' final prayer proved that He didn't try to do it on His own. 
And that's the great truth for us to learn of what we need to do to receive His victory over death. If you try to beat death yourself, guess what? You will lose. Jesus is the only one who's ever won the victory over death. And He's willing to share that victory with us as we surrender to Him, just as He surrendered to the Father. You see, Jesus prayed for His executioners. He answered the repentant thief's prayer from the cross. It shows who He is and what He's like and what He's willing to do for you. What about you? Have you been trying to do it your way or His way? Doing it on your own? How's that working out? Have you tried to do it Jesus' way? He promised to share His success with you. With Jesus, you can die and live to tell about it. Starting today. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This body will die someday, but I'm not going to die. This body will be resurrected because Jesus was resurrected. I'm relying on Jesus. My confidence is not because of me, it's because of Him. Somebody said, well, how can you say you're going to heaven? I said, well, I don't want to call Jesus Christ a liar. If I say I'm not going to heaven, I'm calling Jesus Christ a liar. Because He said, if I rely on Him, that I'll never die. I'm completely confident in what Jesus did, not what I've done. I want you to know that reality. You know, there's a commercial out that's been controversial. Um, I think we've got it on the screen. Who, who's this guy in the commercial? Uh, I, if you've been in an alternate universe for the last 20 years, if you don't know who that is, that's Tiger Woods. That's a Nike commercial, right? And what's it say on there? Winning takes care of everything. Now, why is that commercial controversial? Well, it's controversial because uh, Tiger Woods, a few years ago, uh, it was revealed that he was a serial adulterer, serial adulterer, who tragically saw the dissolution of his marriage and his family, and his career was basically put on hold. But now it appears that after some time that he's finally back in the groove and back to his old ways on the golf course and is winning and is number one in the world again. And the Nike people, who are his biggest sponsors, took an ad out and said, winning takes care of everything. It's controversial because a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. That sends the wrong message. I'm glad there's some pushback. But you see, the truth is, winning may take care of his public image, and his image is the most famous golfer. I was down at the tournament in Orlando a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago. I didn't see him up close, but I saw his entourage. He couldn't even get close. There were thousands of people on whatever hole he was on. I was out there by myself with some other golfer, me and him, just having a good time. And uh, everybody was watching Tiger Woods because his image is back. But I don't care how many golf tournaments he wins. Listen to this. It will not cover his sin. Only the blood of Jesus covers sin. So what we've done, we've, put, we've taken a cue from the Nike commercial, and here's the real story. There's an empty tomb. Winning takes care of everything. Jesus walked out of a tomb, and His victory takes care of it. I pray that Tiger Woods comes to the realization of that. I pray that you know that. If you don't, you can know it today. Father, thank you. Thank you that Jesus won the victory and that His prayers from the cross proves that He wants to share that victory with us. That He made that promise in front of Lazarus' tomb that whoever believes in Him would live even though they died and would never die if they lived and believed in Him. And He showed that He's willing to share that victory that He secured at the cross and confirmed in the tomb with us. I pray that everybody here knows the victory that only Jesus gives. Amen.